Now that we spent way too much time talking about Freud and Jung, let's move on to uh, some other theorists and theories uh, regarding uh, the development of personality theory. So we're gonna go semi-chronologically, um, and it, I think it's a, a good way to go about it because that sort of allows you to see uh, how they saw the world at their time, you know, based on what they had available to them and the ideas that were around, uh, but also how they built off one another uh, and even arose as a response to one another. So we're gonna start sticking with, uh, initially, the psychoanalysts, um, one of the uh, contemporaries of Freud and Jung, although he's not as well-known or influential uh, as the other two, uh, but nonetheless, he was still a prominent psychoanalyst. Um, it's Alfred Adler is his name. So we're still on psychoanalysts, at least the early ones. And um, we'll go with Alfred Adler. All right, Alfred Adler, um, he's gonna be one who focuses a lot on childhood, just like Freud does, but in a different way. So first off, I should mention, he believed the unconscious had in it this uh, very like metaphysical, universal, uh, human <clears throat> desire to escape from or shed this uh, feeling of inferiority uh, to uh, gradually acquire a sense of superiority. Um, as evidenced by, you know, one's ability or accomplishments. Um, and so when I say inferiority, by the way, uh, the way he looked at it, and, you know, there's some truth to this, most kids, when they're little, feel inferior, obviously, because they uh, are two adults um, as far as, you know, abilities um, and uh, capabilities regarding uh, living in this world. So they're, they're smaller, they're weaker, uh, they're more prone to make mistakes, they're less intelligent, they're not fully developed yet, right? And they lack the experience that that, it, that allows you to apply your um, genetic and environmentally uh, provided uh, structure, and then uh, of course add to that through through education and experience. Um, they don't have those things developed yet, so they they technically are inferior uh, regarding those um, uh, those features. Um, so he believed that you're kind of on this quest. All humans are on this quest to escape from that and become like this competent, superior adult. Um, so that, that element isn't necessarily false. So uh, um, uh, driven, I should say behavior, uh, or the unconscious, we'll start with the unconscious. No, we'll say behavior. Behavior uh, driven by a, a universal, or somewhat universal, universal drive, universal unconscious drive, desire, to escape uh, inferiority. So as you do that as a kid, uh, escape inferiority uh, to and develop a sense of superiority. There we go. He argued that, um, of course, we have that drive and it can't just act on its own. It's going to be uh, checked or countered by uh, others in the environment, society, um, ethics, whether that's socially enforced or maybe even internally, like a superego, which is definitely both, instilled by society, uh, and it gives you a sense of conscience. Um, so that's going to, of course, be uh, uh, checked by society, social and ethical factors. And that was the necessary process for development and um, manifesting your behavior. So you're always chasing this, uh, developing uh, uh, a more superior view of yourself uh, to escape the inferiority, but you're of course checked in your ambitions by uh, society and, and the ethical system that the, they've uh, instilled and instilled in you. So um, it's not just clear as like, go win everything and beat everybody. There's some rules attached to how to do that. And of course you have you're bound by the ethical and social uh, constraints around you. Uh, and he argued that was a necessary factor because uh, if you didn't, so uh, if like, let's say society uh, and ethical factors didn't uh, keep you in check realistically, allow this sense of, of superiority to grow and grow and grow, that it would develop uh, into a, a very detrimental, um, uh, even actually like a reverse uh, reversal uh, to making you less actually capable and, and more inferior uh, than you, could have been as an adult. Uh, so if these forces don't check you, 
you'll grow and grow and grow uh, negatively. So uh, if unchecked, uh, you could develop individuals, could develop an inferiority complex. A complex meaning like something that uh, is obsessively driving you to achieve or, or prove and that isn't necessarily true and is probably damaging um, or abnormal. So in for your inferiority complex would mean you're like constantly striving to prove you're superior uh, because you view yourself or, or maybe you don't view yourself as inferior but you worry others view you uh, as inferior and maybe you do yourself as well. Um, so this would mean um, an individual uh, who is uh, egocentric uh, or power hungry or overly boastful, any of those things that you would, you would sort of uh, feel about somebody who is uh, egotistical or too sensitive to criticism or, um, uh, again, acting in a manner that really only serves themselves, they're power hungry, trying to ch achieve status, those sorts of things. That would be a negative manifestation of that. Uh, developmental path. Uh, and th the way he thought you could see that, and again, this is largely going to be what he believes determines one's behavior and personality, is uh, these two forces acting against one another, your des desire to escape inferiority, but then you have those social and ethical checks, and if those fail to uh, manifest or uh, operate properly or equally, then uh, you risk, of course, developing this negative inferiority complex. Uh, and he uh, argued you could see that in, in children, uh, in families. So his explanation for, um, uh, or, or evidence as he, as he thought it was, for this inferiority uh, drive in our unconscious was uh, in families. He believed in the uh, oldest child, you would, uh, the firstborn, you would see the uh, highest drive for achievement. Not just achievement though, acknowledgement. So people acknowledging that you are uh, fantastic or confident or whatever. Uh, and he believed that was because they had to like compensate for the lack of attention they got from their parents because of the younger kids. All right, so obviously I'm not talking about only child here. I'm talking about oldest member of a, of a of oldest child in a family. Uh, then the uh, middle child or middle, middle children would be fiercely competitive, um, but not as focused on the acknowledgement portion. So competitive, and that was, of course, to uh, try to uh, surpass or exceed uh, oldest, older sibling, uh, but not fixed on glory, I guess you could say. It's more of a personal quest for them rather than, you know, uh, an attempt to win praise from others. And they believe that the, uh, uh, well, the youngest child, there we go, I was going to say newest, but that just didn't feel right. Uh, youngest child, or sibling, um, oops, and again, keep in mind, we're back in the, uh, he was from around from 1870 to, um, Adler was, I think 1937 is when he perished. Uh, this was at an, an era when uh, routinely uh, children didn't make it to adulthood. So uh, assuming you got this far and you were the youngest child who survived, this child would be the uh, most uh, dependent, and sociable, uh, because they don't really feel a need to uh, um, seek the attention or approval of others because they uh, believe that, or they have you know, gotten that from their parents as they grew up because they were the last kid and they, they're the baby of the family, the most attention, etc. cetera. Uh, so that was kind of his explanation for it. Um, and you could actually argue some of this might have been a little behaviorist, but uh, it was definitely psychoanalytical because he drew, below, believed in, a, in an unconscious uh, and the impact of your childhood uh, on your um, your adult personality in life, just like Freud did uh, with his um, theories on development and properly moving through those stages of development, otherwise you risk being fixated, as well as this uh, uh, battle between um, our id, superego, uh, and ego as far as um, uh, decoding our unconscious drives that, that uh, m compel or determine or at least partially determine our behavior. All right, so that's the uh, psychoanalyst. Uh, however, there's gonna be a major break from psychoanalytic theory. Um, and it, you could argue it starts back even as early as the, the 1890s with uh, Edward Thorndike's law of effect. But we'll, we'll, we're gonna more so attach it to Pavlov and Watts and in Skinner especially as the start. So uh, behaviorist theories, 
personality. And if you remember your behaviorism at all, the classical and operant conditioning, you know that early behaviorists believed um, you were entirely determined by the environment. So you were, we were all kind of like those classical Lockean blank slates uh, that are uh, shaped entirely by our environment, and uh, which again we know isn't true. Uh, and that was, uh, or sh I shouldn't say it's not true, it's not true the way that it's stated. Those factors do uh, impact our behavior and development, not, not solely, and not even uh, the most significantly actually, uh, but they do play a role. Nonetheless, uh, this was largely driven again by these um, uh, fears uh, or uh, disgust regarding a lot of the evolutionarily uh, or evolutionary and biological explanations for behavior um, that were put forward by, you know, uh, earlier psychologists uh, and uh, theorists, particularly because of the social Darwinist and eugenic and, and eventually Nazi uh, ideologies. Um, so people are, can be kind of fixed on this, your uh, brain itself doesn't matter, it's all based on the outside world. Uh, and you can even say the psychoanalysts partly believed something like that. They, they certainly didn't focus on the internal um, uh, mechanisms or processes of the brain. They focused a lot more on this um, abstract unconscious element and, um, you know, drawing your development from uh, your childhood, which would be an experiential thing. Um, so they're both very much predicated on, especially the behaviorists, on, on experience and being shaped by the outside world, which again, is true partially, but not, not entirely. So behaviorist theory, again, we're gonna focus, uh, um, at least initially, I should say, uh, sole focus initially on uh, external stimuli so your your, your uh, uh, response and the consequences to these external stimuli, these other these external situations. So like something happens, uh, you have a response, and then the consequence of that response, whether it's good or bad, uh, affects whether or not you'll continue uh, using that response or that behavior. Uh, so um, sole focus on external stimuli shaping, uh, I should say determining actually determining behavior. And we see this as uh, early on as um, Pavlov and um, uh, Pavlov and Watson. But again, you could tie Thorndike into this, the law of effect, which you know basically, you know, if something good happens, it increases the likelihood you'll do it again. If something bad happens, it decreases the likelihood you'll do it again. Um, but it gets more consolidated as a field in theory, uh, starting with these guys. So you can certainly uh, link this to Pavlov and Watson. Uh, and classical conditioning, uh, particularly experiments like the uh, Baby Albert experiment, where they absolutely showed that um, they could shape this kid's behavior by conditioning him to be afraid of or okay with certain uh, scenarios uh, or stimuli. So in the, the case of the Baby Albert one, it was the furry animal. Uh, they would, you know, did a loud noise. So the uh, kid would see the animal and it would anticipate the loud noise and cry. So he, they successfully achieved uh, this through experimentation, uh, although be unethical, uh, that uh, they could uh, shape his behavior, this baby Albert. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna say, if we're looking at Albert's uh, experiments especially, you could say probably the 1920s. You could, again, go back even further if you wanted. But the 1920s and 1930s especially, and by the 1930s when Skinner's operant conditioning is out there, it's definitely established up till about the 1960s or so, when this becomes, uh, starts becoming particularly unpopular as a sole explanation for human behavior. All right, uh, so that's a, that's a good start. In fact, Watson's actually quoted as saying, um, uh, I can't remember, the, I should say, I'll paraphrase what he said. Something along the lines of like, give me 12 healthy people, uh, and if their mothers or parents uh, use my correct uh, uh, instructions as far as like rewarding certain behaviors. Um, you, he can make any person want a doctor, a lawyer, uh, a beggar, uh, you know, whatever, whatever person you want. He believed that you didn't have any in, intrinsic uh, or inherited uh, abilities or preference uh, or cap capabilities that you could just entirely shape it uh, based on experience. Um, I should put the quote, uh, Watson um, suggested, or I should say claimed, claimed he could 
uh, shape any person with uh, proper uh, controls, right? So that means uh, rewards and punishments for whatever behavior they want. All right, and this is going to uh, gain a lot more traction when uh, Skinner, of course, introduces or introduces um, in the 1930s, 1930s, uh, operant conditioning, which hopefully you remember what operant conditioning is. Um, class conditioning, again, is when you uh, learn to make associations between a stimuli or a stimulus, and then uh, you, you, you have an associated response or anticipation. Uh, operant conditioning is similar in that you have a, a stimuli, whatever it is, uh, or a situation, which can be a stimuli, um, and then you have a response to that, and uh, your response, the consistency of your response is going to match the consequence. And the consequence is either you're rewarded, so you're like, oh, that's a good response, I'll keep doing it. So you, you keep responding that way, or oh, you get a bad response, like a punishment, whatever. So you learn to avoid that uh, uh, response uh, to that stimuli. So we know that operant conditioning absolutely can affect behavior. Um, it doesn't determine it solely, but it absolutely does, and that's why you can, uh, you know, train animals and, and condition, you know, kids to uh, behave in certain socially acceptable ways, like, you know, punish them for biting and stealing from other people and reward them for being polite and sharing, things like that. Um, so definitely possible uh, to do. Um, so again, he's the one that really formulated this uh, uh, idea of um, an external stimuli, And that's going to be confusing, uh, I'm assuming, to many of you. External stimuli means any situation where something happens. It could be something you see, something you hear, feel, taste, whatever. That's the stimuli, whatever situation it is. Um, and so how you respond and then the consequence of that response determines if you're going to keep responding that way. Right, so if the teacher um, will go simple. Uh, let's talk about the behavior of whether or not a particular student will answer questions in class. The stimuli, or the stimulus in this case, the teacher asking a question to the class, like, oh, what's the, what's operant conditioning, right? So if you raise your hand and answer it, and you get it right, and um, uh, you get some sort of praise for that, whether it's approval from your peers or the teacher, or maybe you get rewarded with extra credit, whatever it might be, um, that is going to give you a, a positive uh, or negative, but it's gonna uh, reinforce the behavior. It's gonna give you a good outcome. So you're now more likely to uh, offer an answer. However, if uh, your first few go terribly and like you're wrong and people laugh at you or you at least feel like people are, are, are judging you or the teacher you know, dismisses your response or makes fun of whatever it might be, uh, you get a bad uh, outcome, a bad consequence. So that response of answering is uh, going to uh, diminish in the future. All right, so he's going to form this external stimuli plus your response plus the consequence uh, determines behavior. Obviously, it would take a long time to shape this. Uh, you're not going to, of course, just because you have one good uh, uh, consequence of a response doesn't mean you're going to do that every single time. But the more consistently you can tie these together, uh, the more likely it is you're going to make that a part of your personality according to Skinner behaviors. In fact, a guy named Richard, oh man, I just forgot his name, Richard Hoherdstein. I might have his name wrong. If I, if I remember, I'll, I'll correct it in the comment. Um, he's going to come along later. And this is more so a part of the movement where behaviorists have accepted that there are internal processes and factors that affect behavior. Uh, but he's going to add um, to Skinner's theory or expand on it to say, not only will that affect your behavior, but that can affect your attitude. Uh, because as you go through life and you start lining up the, your responses with the consequences you like, that's gonna actually shift your attitude uh, regarding um, a particular uh, set of circumstances. So uh, uh, if you constantly get the responses, or sorry, if you constantly get good consequences for your responses, like say you constantly answer questions and you're constantly rewarded for it, that's gonna change your attitude uh, because now you realize that, oh, I like school because when I go there, uh, I constantly get what I, what I want. Uh, whereas, you know, if you are constantly having bad consequences uh, for whatever your responses are in school, like say, again, you uh, are made fun of for something by other students or picked on or, like I said, the teacher uh, or other students uh, make fun of you or you feel judged, 
that's gonna make you not enjoy it, so it's a bad outcome, so you're, it's gonna cause, over time, your attitude to shift to uh, disliking school in general. All right, so that, that's what he, uh, he would attach to it. So then he extended theory to include, um, uh, how can I put consistency in expectations So uh, i.e. response plus consequence, matching what you anticipate, uh, can shift attitudes. So whether I like school or not is going to be dependent on many factors. Um, it's going to be, or sorry, not many factors, but many uh, uh, consequences and responses. So one of them, again, I could say would be the uh, answer to the question, getting praised for it. And then maybe another one could be, oh, um, I like the... <laughs> I like the school food at the cafeteria, or I like my friends because I, uh, when we play, we all have fun and blah, 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 all that stuff, right? Uh, so if all those things compound, you're constantly getting a bunch of uh, good consequences for your responses and you, and you learn to associate those, that's going to cause you to like school in general. Uh, so it wasn't any one thing that made you like or dislike school, but over time as you uh, consistently are able to predict outcomes and get the outcome you want, that's gonna shift your attitude based on if you like or dislike school or whatever it might be. So that's how it works. And uh, no question, there is um, truth to this, this sequence and this absolutely does um, impact one's behavior. Um, it is however, again, not the sole explanation for our behavior or our personality, but is definitely at least one factor in there. All right, so that's behaviorism and behaviorists. Um, and they are going to totally um, uh, disregard any sort of um, um, uh, other processes uh, regarding internal processes like your emotions, your, your uh, natural character uh, or, or trait uh, interests, like things you like or dislike, uh, how sensitive you are to um, um, good and bad consequences, that sort of thing. They don't believe in anything going on in here. Uh, being relevant, they just believe that this helps carry this process out. So you just take in the information, sensory, and then uh, uh, the, the consequence shapes your perception. Again, partially right, but not entirely right. Okay, the next set of theories that are going to emerge and challenge behaviorism and psychoanalysis, but definitely behaviorism, uh, is the uh, humanist humanist uh, set of personality theories. All right, as the name implies, uh, it is focused much more on the individual human. And they, uh, I don't know if they chose this per se, I believe they did, but whether it was chosen by them or given uh, to them this, this name, this field name of humanist, it's because they're going to de-emphasize looking at humans as kind of like these uh, robots that have like these fixed mechanisms um, where you, know, you have this biological mechanism that takes in information and then it experiences uh, consequences and then it changes its perception. That kind of implies you're, again, almost like a robot because you're just born blank and you're shaped by your environment. Uh, or the unconscious, either you're born with this unconscious and it's just kind of like controlling you. To some extent, you have to figure out what it is. Uh, humanists take a different approach. They say, no, you're not determined by these like mechanisms, but rather you're uh, an individual with a free will. And it's your job uh, to, uh, when you're put into the world, to uh, figure yourself out and um, live, the, live your life through subjectively experiencing the world, uh, meaning like how you interpret it being good or bad or likable or not. Uh, and that is what's going to guide and dictate uh, your life. Um, and that, um, that, that's kind of the focus of it. I'll get into more detail in a second. So humanist personality theory. They're going to uh, reject... A, uh, a fixed uh, mechanical um, set of explanations for behavior. Uh, instead, they're going to uh, highlight, they're going to focus on free will and the human being as a whole. Rather than a series of, uh, like I said, fixed mechanisms, components. So they're not going to look at you uh, through a laboratory 
uh, lens. They're not going to experiment on you. They're not going to try to figure out mechanically how you work, your behavior works. They're going to just kind of try to figure out who you are as a whole. They're not going to look at individual traits or individual stimuli or responses to that. They're just going to uh, try to engage with you and help you discover uh, who you are and how to go about manifesting yourself in the world. All right, so um, how can I phrase this? That's their view. I guess I'll start with kind of the, the, the first two. So this is going to be largely developed by um, two gentlemen named uh, Carl Rogers and uh, Abraham Maslow. I, I mentioned Maslow before. Um, and they're going to be uh, the ones that sort of uh, develop humanist uh, field, psychology. All right. Uh, I'm going to start here with Maslow. I'll mention Rogers a little more to get uh, towards the end. Uh, but they, they both did work together quite a while, for quite a while, uh, collaborating. They do have some nuanced views and applications, but they do share this, this general set of views that you're an individual uh, who uh, is... Uh, operates with free will and you subjectively experience the world. Subjectively meaning like it's the world is different through the eyes of everybody and whether something is good or not or likable or unlikable depends on the individual and their free will in their mind. Not on like the mechanical mechanisms of your brain or your unconscious or whatever. All right, so I should actually put that by the way. Uh, subjective experience. Is more important than um, uh, biological or environmental or unconscious uh, factors. Okay, so uh, Maslow, he's going to believe essentially that I'm going to pair. I'm going to summarize uh, or generalize or simplify, oversimplify probably, but certainly try to simplify his views here. Uh, Maslow basically believed that um, all humans had a, had a similar sort of uh, general goal. Now, how you get there and, and exactly what that goal looks like when it's actually carried out, the details, is going to be different, hence the free will. But we all kind of want the same thing. We have like a basic set of needs. That's where his hierarchy uh, comes from, hierarchy needs. All humans uh, have a similar fundamental set of goals and needs. Um, and then uh, once these lower needs are met, lower needs met, he focused a lot on individuals that would try to uh, transcend or what he referred to as self-actualizing uh, in the world. So self-actualized, actualized means to make real or find out or make manifest. So the idea is once your lower needs are met, and I'll get into that in a second, uh, you get to the, the final stage of which is self-actualization where you are fully comfortable and accepting of the world and all of your needs are met. So you focus on expanding yourself as much as possible. And I don't mean like physically expanding. I mean expanding your abilities. So uh, setting goals, maximizing your potential, uh, being the fullest version of, of whatever you can be. Uh, so that means, uh, again, pursuing goals you have interest in. And a lot of that focuses on, too, uh, fixing fixable problems. So you, these, these sorts of people at this stage are not focused on things you can't change. You're going to focus uh, specifically and intensely on things you can change or affect. And again, you could look at it more selfishly as just things I want to do, which is definitely the case with some people. But also some people, in doing so, uh, intentionally or not, end up solving problems for themselves and others around them. So whether it's a very selfish outlook uh, or it's one that's more uh, altruistic or, or, or uh, not self-centered at least, that they are going to make the world better uh, generally by solving problems, whether it's for themselves or for others or, or, or however it's going to go about. So well, once all needs met, um, individuals tend to pursue self actualization so this is what governs a lot of our behavior um, but the the problem is of course getting there so let me first briefly go over the hierarchy of needs and then um, briefly recap the self-actualization part and then um, discuss what 
life through the humanist lens looks like uh, in, in, in therapy. So uh, he's got his theory on the hierarchy of needs. So hierarchy of needs uh, goes basically like this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the most broad tiers here. Just know that some of these tiers have like sub tiers, but uh, the base need that everyone needs to uh, take care of, otherwise they literally can't exist, are your physiological needs. Uh, that's just like, you need to have food, water, air, etc. Without those things, you will literally die. Uh, so when people don't have these things, that is what determines their behavior. They are focused on acquiring those things. Oh, I'm going to starve or uh, die of um, uh, thirst or, um, you know, what's the other need? Shelter. You know, if I don't have those things, my whole life is generally focused on getting those things for myself or my family. All right, so that'll determine your behavior. Next behavior determinant would be um, safety needs. So again, you could re refer that to shelter or, or having weapons or being part of a group or whatever it might be. Uh, if you are in immediate danger, that is going to be the focus of your behavior. That's gonna dictate uh, how you view the world. That's gonna uh, create a certain set of anxieties for you that you're going to uh, try to live with or have to live with and try to cope with or, or better. So once those safety needs are met, so again, that means like you have a house or a shelter, you have some sort of protection uh, through um, uh, weapons or a system or others, or you live in a society that has protection, generally speaking. Uh, once those needs are met, you can go up uh, another rung, which would be uh, belonging needs. So once, uh, and these can be kind of intertwined, but once we've got our physiological needs, again, food, water, air, etc. cetera, uh, safety needs, we're not in, under immediate threat of dying from some external factor like an animal or disease or another human, whatever it might be. Uh, we would go to the the uh, strata of, of uh, or the stratum of um, belonging. So humans have an intense feeling or need or desire uh, to belong and be loved by others. So again, once you bet these things, that's when you focus on forming strong friendships or maintaining family relationships, uh, and then especially uh, even after adolescence, anyway, uh, an intense focus on finding a uh, a romantic partner or spouse. Uh, those will uh, dominate your uh, uh, anxieties or thoughts and behaviors as pursual or pursuit of that, uh, that belonging sense. So if you don't have those things, that's going to dominate uh, your life. Uh, and again, that's, that's kind of what happens as you go up this tier. Uh, once you have these, then you focus on these and that dictates your behavior and thoughts and anxieties. And then you have that, then this is what uh, dictates your behaviors and thoughts and anxieties. And then after the belonging uh, has been met, and this can also intertwine a bit, uh, with the uh, with the belonging, but then you have your uh, self um, self esteem uh, needs, and I'm not a big fan of self esteem um, because it's actually well. I'll get into that when I talk about personality, but no, I'll tell you now. So self esteem is uh, not really much of a psychological concept. I realize that um, the theories of, of Maslow have been kind of uh, referenced to uh, as this, at least in this tier. But we've actually found that one's self-image, like how they feel about themselves and, you know, therefore you should only say positive things about people and never hurt their feelings or whatever, uh, which, which is true. You should never just go out intentionally trying to hurt people's feelings and be hurt, hurtful, hateful, or mean. That's not what we're saying. Uh, but one's self-esteem isn't as much dependent on the praise they're getting. It's much more dependent on how their trait personality, their sensitivity to negative emotion, which is neuroticism, and their sensitivity to positive emotion, which is roughly extroversion, uh, how those two intermingle. So if somebody is low in extroversion and high in eroticism, doesn't really matter. They're gonna have low self-esteem or they're gonna have issues with self-esteem throughout their life. Uh, whereas somebody who has low in eroticism and then uh, normal or high uh, extroversion, they're uh, hardly ever going to have self-esteem issues, whether or not somebody's providing it to them uh, on the outside. But again, the opinions of others definitely do matter. Uh, and if you are going out just trying to uh, hurt people, then that's definitely not uh, what, what uh, anyone would, would condone. Uh, however, uh, you should be able to provide constructive criticism to people, especially when they ask for it, uh, uh, and be honest about it, uh, reasonably honest about it. Anyways, I just had to do that in because I see a lot of stuff on, on online about self-esteem and how to, achieve it and the 
urgency of it, it's, most of it's misinformed. Um, but I should mention, by the way, that's not how Maslow intended it either. He means self-esteem as in kind of like your self-confidence uh, in a more realistic manner. So this is where people would try to achieve some sort of uh, notoriety or competency uh, from others. So here's where you would, again, try to become competent at something, uh, whether it's life in general or a specific field or ability, uh, and you want some sort of social recognition for that. Because uh, you can think you're great, but if you're not actually great, it's not gonna be reflected in the attitudes of anybody else. Uh, so people do, uh, whether they like it or not, uh, depend to some degree on how they are viewed in relation to others uh, by others. Um, so that's what we mean by that. So that's somebody who is looking for uh, achievements in a career field or family, uh, starting and supporting or, or nurturing a family, um, things like that. Uh, once that's met, once somebody feels like they're competent in a field and they're recognized for that, or they've, they've found their niche, whatever it might be, that's when that needs to be met. So lastly, would be, at least in the way we're summarizing it, would be the self-actualization. Uh, this is what we described up here. This is where uh, one pursues a full, pursues actualization And that can mean like, uh, kind of like a transformation. Transformation into, or actually I'd say probably a better way to phrase it is a pursuit of one who is fully uh, aligned and confident so that all their needs are met. Uh, that pursues goals, self-improvement, and uh, achieving full potential. And that can manifest itself in different ways, hence the um, um, actualization, which say self-actualization, but um, that's the, the free will element and the subjective uh, experience. So every person's going to have a bit different, um, a different preference on like what their meaningful and fulfilling goals might be or what their uh, potential abilities or capabilities might be. That's going to vary. And it can be more selfish oriented or more uh, group oriented. Nonetheless, uh, they're going to either focus on achieving a specific goal, whether it's becoming a great marathon runner or or, or building a building or achieving some status of wealth, uh, or it's gonna be you know, uh, problem solving, and of course you're gonna do problem solving to achieve those anyway, but uh, it might be more socially oriented problem solving, like bettering a social system or you know, helping gain rights or, or, or support or medical supplies or jobs or whatever to certain groups of people or areas, whatever it might be. Uh, that would be the uh, self-actualization. So your needs are all met, now you can focus on maximizing yourself, uh, which will almost inevitably, even if you don't intend it to, make the, the world around you better uh, as a result. So that's, uh, that's the humanist theory. And this, by the way, is what drives our behavior according to them. Uh, your anxieties and behaviors are dependent upon what needs you do or don't have at the time, and in combination with your free will and subjective experience in the world. Uh, as such, this is kind of a preview for Unit 8, which we won't be covering in 2020, uh, but uh, those of you 2021 and beyond will. That's what uh, guides the uh, humanist uh, therapeutic approach. That approach isn't there to tell you what the answer is per se. Uh, that one is there to more so provide you with uh, these needs here, and maybe even these needs. Uh, they're trying to help you uh, move up this hierarchy more or less uh, by helping you guide yourself. They're not there to, to be an expert or you know, prescribe a medication or anything like that. They believe you are capable, you're, you're a generally trustworthy person, um, and that you're capable of fixing your own problems uh, as long as uh, you feel like these needs are met and you feel like you're accepted and understood by another person. Uh, and so you're there as a therapist, a humanist therapist, to be honest and genuine uh, in your words and actions when you're responding to the person, even if it means being brutally honest, uh, and help them once that, that, that connection's established, uh, once they, they trust you because you 
uh, are listening to them, you're genuine, you accept them for who they are despite their faults, and then you're uh, also, of course, uh, understanding. You, you relay the idea that uh, you know what they're saying and you understand why they feel that way or why they have that perspective. Once that connection's formed between the, the client and the therapist, then your job is to help them discover what their issues are and how they can solve it. And, and they're supposed to generate that. So you, you help provide a mirror of sorts by forming that relationship and that connection with them. Uh, and then you would, of course, uh, 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 point things out. Like uh, when, when certain self-images they have don't match up with how it is in reality, like if they think they're, I'm gonna be, to give you a ridiculous example, but say they think they're a, they should be a world-class sprinter uh, but they're just not fast. Uh, this is obviously a huge exaggeration, but this is where the therapist would be uh, like, um, actually, and then you know, point out that they clearly do not have the characteristics of a, um, of a world-class sprinter, namely the, the speed or ability, but that's where you'd be honest, you'd help that person realize where their incongruencies lie in their image of themselves versus uh, the reality of the situation. And then they can realize that and then sort of uh, uh, learn to, to accept that or, or, or change that or uh, mend that, that view or that behavior, that relationship, somebody else, whatever it might be. Uh, that's gonna guide that humanist approach. Again, which is uh, <clears throat> genuine, it's kind of like a tear here. So one would be genuine uh, therapist response. Then you would, of course, be, um, you would be three, four, five, six. Uh, then you would be um, accepting of the person. Uh, that doesn't mean, by the way, you think that they're perfect the way they are. That means you realize that they are flawed, but they are legitimately doing their best in the world according to their understanding. That's different than saying, no, you're perfect the way you are. It's saying, I know you're flawed, and I know you know you're flawed, and that's okay. We're, and I know you're trying to make it better, uh, and, and I'm here to help you do that. And then, of course, that they uh, show that they, um, they show that they, um, through being empathetic, they're going to show that they understand them. So they are going to uh, uh, mimic or reflect what they say uh, accurately so that the patient understands, the therapist understands them. Uh, and that, of course, is going to allow uh, the uh, therapist-client uh, relationship to, uh, to uh, take root. And then stage five would be helping them realize their, their internal incongruencies, like their own problems, their image issues, their, and find their own solutions. So uh, help patient discover uh, own incongruencies. And then six would be uh, uh, to help patient solve uh, problems or pursue actualization. So that's the, that's the, that's the pro, uh, process there. It's very individually based. It's not like a, a, a plug-in sort of thing, like here's the answer, here's the medication, here's your problem. Uh, they're not gonna explain something to you or give you advice because you've gotten that your whole life. They're here to help you feel accepted uh, and know that you can trust them and that you understand them and then that way they can help you understand what you believe is wrong with yourself and then how, how to go about fixing it. All right, that's probably what I need to say, but I think it's a good idea of what humanist uh, um, uh, therapy and the approach is going forward uh, for unit eight. All right, last one uh, for today is gonna be the social, oh, I didn't put the times by the way. This is roughly speaking from the 1940s to the 1980s or so. Uh, and again, that's a major response to uh, behaviorism. So, behaviorists, 1930s or so, 1960s, and that's gradually, uh, not only replaced, but challenged by uh, the uh, humanist personality theories. But the 1960s are when we're going to uh, really see the decline of behaviorism, um, as far as its sole emphasis goes, or its domination of the psychological field, based on uh, external factors. Uh, regarding uh, um, uh, environmental stimuli and, and the consequences uh, for your responses to that. So this one you can kind of lump some 
describe as sociocultural uh, theories uh, for personality. There's definitely not one you can give here, so I wanna make that clear. Uh, I'm gonna use, well, I'll just use one example because he kind of sets the basis for it. Uh, and there's a lot of other theories that are refined and tuned and, uh, or uh, extend from this set of theories. Um, but this is the one that's going to uh, largely supplant behaviorism and even humanism to an extent um, as the dominant theory for personality. And it's gonna to lead to the, our eventual emphasis on, on uh, trait personality and personality testing as not the soul, but the primary feature or mechanism for personality. So this one is gonna be uh, the closest version to, to true as far as what your behavior is de determined by. Uh, than uh, at least compared to uh, the, the current one, which is based on trait personality. Uh, so it, it's, it's really close, and, and uh, in fact, it's definitely right. It's just not specifically right about uh, these factors it's going to uh, uh, mention. So this is going to largely start uh, in the 1960s. I think in 1961 is when uh, we had the famous experiment for the Bobo the doll, or Bobo the clown. Um, but you can say this is still going uh, today to some degree. Um, and this is gonna again re replace uh, the previous theories for the most part. So a lot is gonna be put forward by this guy named Albert Bandura. Who, by the way, in case you didn't know, is considered the most uh, important uh, and influential living psychologist. Uh, he's cited more than uh, anybody in the psychological field except for uh, and it might have changed by the because this is this was like a couple decades ago when they did this measurement. Uh, he was only outnumbered by I think uh, Freud, Skinner, and who else? Piaget, I think. Um, he might be number one now, or, or at least higher up. So Bandura, um, he is again going to uh, uh, propose or reject rejects um, psychoanalytical and behaviorist uh, explanations. I'm not sure how explicitly he uh, opposed humanist explanations, but I know for sure he definitely criticized particularly behaviorist uh, specifically. So he's gonna reject those uh, explanations uh, and suggest behavior and personality by extension. Uh, is not dictated by any one factor, whether it's the unconscious or it's uh, external stimuli, uh, but it's actually three factors that all affect one another. So it's not any one of them because all three of them exist as separate factors and all three of them uh, can actually uh, affect the other. So he's gonna have a, the term he uses this for this is called reciprocal determinism. And reciprocal means uh, you like it's like a given give, give and take uh you you do something and then the the reciprocity is it does the same thing back to you so like if you're being reciprocal and somebody hits you you hit them back if somebody does you a favor you do them a favor back if somebody insults you insult them back that's reciprocity so uh reciprocal determinism means one factor does something which affects another factor and then that factor uh in turn changes that initial factor and it's a cycle of constantly changing and affecting one another indefinitely so uh, we'll, we'll, um, we'll get into that in a second. And so just behavior, personality is uh, determined, or influenced, I should say, or shaped, or we'll just say determined, by an interaction of three factors, primarily three factors. And that's gonna be uh, your um, internal processes, your environment. And when I say environment, I literally mean where you are and the people around you. I don't mean uh, the next step, which is the behaviorist part, because he's gonna, of course, admit that um, uh, behaviorism is correct partially, but not entirely. So he says that these two are the biggest factors, uh, but also you're, of course, gonna have uh, external uh, stimuli or at least your experience with them, I should say experience. So what I do is dependent upon three factors. Number one, 
my internal processes. So maybe my trait preferences for uh, doing things or not doing things, whatever the activity is or the people involved, uh, or as well as my emotional response or fear uh, to that uh, situation or, or, or uh, you know, joy or enjoyment. Um, that's going to be one factor. The other factor would be the actual physical environment. So like if it's doing or not doing something, that's gonna be dependent upon uh, my environment, who's there, where it is, what time it is, et cetera. That's all gonna play into whether or not I actually do or don't do something or what I do. Uh, and then the external stimuli, that's based on our experience of, of the consequences for our responses and actions. So our memory is definitely gonna have, uh, and experience is definitely gonna have an impact on whether or not we do something. So that probably didn't help a whole lot of you. Um, uh, let me try to explain this with an example. So um, this is, um, let's go with rock climbing. I think this is the example of my notes. So the likelihood that you will or won't go rock climbing and how you act when you are rock climbing, uh, it's not clear cut. Uh, what you actually do uh, whether you go or not, and then what you do while you go, and, and how uh, how well you do, or or how quickly you want to give up or not give up power, whatever it means, whatever I mean, whatever it implies, um, that behavior is going to be determined by all three of these factors, uh, and they're all going to uh, interact uh, to, to determine one another. I forgot to actually write it up there, uh, and these three, all three, interact. Actually, I thought it written. I shouldn't may be so redundant. Uh, that essentially defines what's called reciprocal I could actually write here reciprocal determinism. There we go. So that is essentially that. That your behavior is dependent on three factors. Internal processes, emotions, thoughts, etc. Uh, environment, the physical surroundings, and the, your experience uh, uh, with uh, uh, the external stimuli in that situation. So those three are all going to play a role in um, affecting your behavior. And they're all going to affect each other too, which is why you get the reciprocal determinism, because they all affect one another. So rock climbing. Let's go with internal processes. So what's going to impact your decision to go? I'll put go or no. Go or no. So your, your friends invite you to a rock climbing trip, or let's just say a rock climbing trip in general, you going on one or not. Uh, one thing that's gonna affect you is your internal process. So your emotions or thoughts about rock climbing. So um, do you like going outdoors? Do you like getting sweaty? Uh, do you like um, uh, going up on, on big things or things that are difficult or strenuous? Do you like hanging out with your friends? Uh, outdoors or indoors, like those are all factors and preferences that are kind of related to your trait uh, or, or internal uh, uh, preferences. So that's going to be also your emotion too, like how afraid of you are, are you of those situations? Um, are you afraid of uh, driving up there um, or are you afraid of uh, going on the actual uh, being with a lot of people, people you don't know maybe? Uh, are you afraid of heights? Those are all things that are going to affect your decision. Uh, so that's going to be your emotions, or your likes and dislikes. All of those are internal processes uh, that you uh, don't have a whole lot of control over. All right, that's not the only thing though. The other thing is going to be the environment itself. So this I think you can agree would affect whether or not you decide to go and when you go, how much you enjoy it, what you do. Uh, the actual physical environment, uh, that could mean when you get there, who's there? Do you, uh, is it a lot of people you don't know? Are you by yourself? Um, are there um, your friends there? Are the friends there that you trust and enjoy? Are they acquaintances? Um, are there um, people you dislike that will be there? Uh, is there gonna be an instructor? Uh, are there safety mechanisms or harnesses for you to be free climbing? Uh, these are all factors that uh, um, impact your decision to go around. What's the weather gonna be like? Is it gonna be cold, rainy, sunny, hot? What's it gonna be, right? So uh, uh, the people that are there, um, is the uh, climb extremely difficult or not? So then the, uh, uh, the, the actual mountain or rock face, I guess I'll say rock face because that could be a mountain or a rock, actual rock face, uh, the in in presence of an instructor or not. 
all those things are going to interact to uh, increase or decrease the likelihood of you engaging. By the way, that will actually affect your emotions too. So if some of these features are not what you, um, uh, are not optimal for you, like let's say you don't have a lot of friends there that you like or people there that you don't like or a lot of people you don't know, uh, or it's uh, the, the rock climbing, uh, the, the face or the safety mechanisms are, are difficult or not there. Uh, or the instructor is not there, or there's not enough instructors or whatever it might be, that's gonna cause you to uh, perceive it differently. You're gonna have different emotional rises. Uh, you're gonna like or dislike the situation more. So they're gonna, of course, impact you. And then of course, you know, these emotions can also change your perception of these environmental factors themselves. So here's, there's the reciprocal determinism. They're both gonna affect each other. Uh, and then lastly, uh, your uh, previous experience, in this case, we're gonna be Talk about external stimuli, meaning uh, you get some sort of stimulation uh, and then a response and a consequence. So um, there's a couple things that go here. Have you ever accomplished something that was difficult or strenuous? Okay, uh, was that enjoyable or not? And most people would agree that yes, it is. So you've got the experience of achieving a difficult goal that usually has a positive um, consequence, right? We enjoy it, it feels fulfilling, or we like the admiration we get from others or praise, whatever it might be, right? So um, your uh, experience past successes, right? That could be an opportunity to grow and something you can be proud of later. Or <laughs> I'm sure at this point, uh, whether you're an adolescent or older, you've probably fallen on a rock or asphalt or concrete before, and you know that hurts. Uh, so you know that the, uh, the external stimuli falling or scratching yourself on um, rock surface or a hard surface, that sucks. That's not a consequence you enjoy. Uh, so that might cause you to, of course, uh, fear going on this thing and falling off and hurting yourself or potentially dying. Maybe you've seen videos or, or you're just aware of the fact that uh, if you fall from, a hall, uh, from high up, that could, that could severely uh, harm you or, or kill you, right? So then uh, um, past uh, pains or knowledge of um, uh, fatalities. You could argue that's an internal process, but I mean, if you watched a video and saw somebody fall and get hurt or die or whatever it might be, or you saw it in person, uh, that would be um, an experience. You, 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 you had some sort of external stimuli uh, visually, uh, and you, you had a consequence, probably an internal consequence, certainly, but, but a consequence nonetheless. So those are all going to interact to determine whether you go or not, and then how you act there when you do go. Uh, whether you're reserved or open or relaxed or excited or fearful, all that's going to interact to uh, affect that. And that's what reciprocal determinism is. Uh, these three features all interact with one another to determine uh, behavior. Uh, and that's uh, more or less what Bandura is going to suggest here. Uh, and he's largely right. These factors absolutely do affect your behavior and decision to not or to do something or not to do something. But uh, kind of a preview for our, our next and final topic on personality is going to be, he's right about these, but one thing he's not entirely correct about uh, at the time, and again, keep in mind, when he developed these, these theories in the 60s, we did not have the machines that were capable of, of, of measuring you know, internal processes in the brain. We did not have the Human Genome Project, which cataloged genes, and we, we found correlations in studies with adoption studies and fraternal twin studies and identical twin studies that showed personality and behavior based on genes, uh, nor did he have the you know, sets of, of data that we do now uh, uh, regarding uh, trait personality. So one thing that he's gonna be a little incomplete on, uh, but not wrong about, but incomplete on is that all three of these, while absolutely playing a role in your environment and experience absolutely play a role, but even these are impacted by um, your uh, traits, trait uh, personality. So um, through a combination of your inherited genes uh, and your environment, and again, by that I mean, of course, your upbringing, your access to education and um, nutrition, so your brain develops properly, as well as epigenetically through uh, like uh, hormone exposure, uh, whether it's uh, through gestation, gestation period or, you know, it's as an infant, child, a teenager, whatever it might be. Uh, those are actually much bigger factors that make you 
more likely that affect your experiences um, and responses to these factors. So obviously this is gonna be included here already in trait, so I guess I don't have to make that point. But these two uh, are actually tied significantly to your trait um, desirability or your trait uh, preference. So like for example, you liking uh, there being people you uh, know there or not um, uh, is gonna be dependent upon uh, your trait extroversion, how much you like uh, interacting with other people or, 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 or talking to other people and et cetera. Uh, same with experience too. Your preference for or predisposition to remember or value positive past experiences or fear negative past experiences, that's gonna be dependent upon your um, uh, trait extroversion, right, with the positive emotion portion, your enthusiasm, uh, or uh, it's gonna be determined by, uh, um, or largely determined by your neuroticism, your sensitivity to negative emotion. So uh, somebody who's high in neuroticism, low in extroversion is gonna be very sensitive to bad things, and that's gonna really affect uh, how they act in the future if something bad happens to them uh, or they fear something. So again, when you look at it practically, yes, these factors all impact you, but uh, these are tied closely to one's uh, trait personality, which is a mostly genetic, but obviously uh, a significant portion is environmental as well, as far as epigenetics and hormone exposure and, and even uh, upbringing to some extent, particularly the nutritional and educational value. Uh, but we'll talk about that one tomorrow. Nonetheless, uh, he was going absolutely in the correct direction. And uh, this is a set of theories that's going to largely displace the, uh, uh, the incumbent uh, psychoanalytic, uh, behaviorist, and even uh, humanist theories. And uh, beginning with the cognitive revolution and these discoveries about social learning, uh, learning through uh, observing others and, uh, and, and, and interacting with the world in combination with the internal processes, that is going to uh, shape modern psychology to uh, the more biopsychosocial uh, trait personality set of theories we, we, we have now. So that's that.